Thank you for listening to the Monday American Podcast. It's a podcast covering American history, and we put the story back in history. If you'd like to help support us on our mission to reach more people and show them a new interest in history, specifically American history, but any history, really, you can support us on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com forward slash Monday American. You can choose if you'd like to support any dollar amount you choose, as little or as much, hint, hint, wink, wink, as you'd like, by a monthly pledge, or you can support the podcast by pledging a amount per episode, since sometimes we go more than a month between an episode, and it wouldn't be fair to charge you or to accept your pledge if we aren't producing any content. As always, any dollar, 100% of every pledge donation that we receive goes directly into funding the show overhead, the cost of running the podcast and improving it so that the show gets better and you can see a return for your investment. Thank you again. And I hope you enjoy this episode. You're listening to the Monday American, the show that puts the story back into history. Making history come alive, one episode at a time. The show made for the people, by the people. Visit themondayamerican.com to get more. Dive into the Monday American. Don't worry, we'll be gentle. The American Westward Migration. It's a fun topic. It's a fun story, and I hope you enjoy the dissection of the story as I go through it. So some of you might be wondering why I chose this story specifically. Well, first of all, it's it's something I felt like I could do in a single episode versus a multi-episode series, which, you know, it's been a while since I've done just a single episode on, on just one topic. Uh, it might be a long episode, but I'll try to keep it as short as I can. And when I was going through the most recent series, I guess like the last five series spanning, what, 15 episodes or so, I suddenly realized I've been doing exclusively American military history. And there's more to American history than just the military. Although, of course, my bias says that the military aspect of American history is perfection and awe-inspiring and all those ridiculous things you can say, America. This is a story that's vitally important to the history of America. It's something that has directly shaped the American spirit of the people of today. And it's also a rare story that spans, I mean, really a century or so. It's got aspects of both domestic and international relations tied out, tied within the whole story. But most of all, what I love about this story and hate is that it teaches us as Americans or anyone learning of American history or just it's applicable to anyone today. It's just the story of American history. It teaches our potential to achieve truly amazing things, and it displays the very best traits of America while simultaneously it teaches us of our potentially disastrous methods we can take in order to achieve those amazing feats. And it shows us our worst acts. So it gives us some of the bad, but alongside the good. It's a rare find in history to find a story like this that spans such a long time and had such a profound impact on the world, really, that includes all those aspects. And I'm very excited to dive in. When the settlers first arrived on the New World and the American shore, the what would be American shores, and they were colonizing, what stood before them was a frontier. And I always picture the boundary of the frontier of these colonists, similar to, and humor me for a minute, the the forest that uh, the talking trees <laughs> live in, in the Lord of the Rings movie. So if you've seen the movie, there's a part where two of the characters, they get uh, kidnapped by the bad guys and they basically camp out for the night 
in captivity next to this this forest and it's kind of got this enchanted vibe to it and there's you know mm-hmm. someone maybe have had preluded earlier that you you know don't go in there it's you know essentially haunted or it's just dangerous whatever but when the camera pans out and you see the forest it's a dark ominous type of fisheye lens shot that just kind of it just breeds this creepy boundary effect. And I always, for some reason, imagine that there's a settlement and just off the edge of that settlement is this frontier forest that gradually and slowly just moves farther and farther until it's no longer there at all. And that's what I always think. And I'm sure that these colonists had to have some kind of feeling like that. They had no idea what was beyond there. And even worse, if they did, they knew it was usually Indians that they pissed off and it was dangerous for them. It was a very interesting type of people that came over to the new world. And that leads me to the first part of American frontier expansion. To say that the frontier had a profound impact on the unique characteristics of America and the Americans within it would be an understatement. But make no mistake about it, it didn't just stem from a single source. You had the European heritage, the continuing impact of ideas coming in from abroad. There was a mingling, a melting pot of people, the spread of the Industrial Revolution, the growth of class consciousness, it all contributed to the characteristics that made America, America. Yet not one single event or force did more to Americanize the nation's people and its institutions than the repeated reconstruction of society that was happening on the Western edge of the settlements during the essentially the three centuries required to occupy the continent. This is called the frontier hypothesis, and it's the first thing that jumps out when you start researching this story heavily. It's at the beginning of just about every book that I've read so far on this topic, and it seems to hold true. This was a hypothesis first put forth by Frederick Jackson Turner in 1890. He was a history instructor at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, It was a historical declaration in a paper. It was called The Significance of the Frontier in American History. He read it at the Chicago meeting of the American Historical Association in 1893. The most unique characteristic of that environment that made America, America, as Turner felt, was the presence of of an area of free land on the western edge of continually advancing settlements. And over the course of time, in their thoughts and their habits, these eastern people would shed the sophisticated societies that they were a part of, and they would alter their ways of life entirely. They would seek new means for using natural resources, or they would adapt older practices to the new environments around them. Innovation, adaption, and invention in economics, social organization, and government were the characteristics of this frontier life. The result of this was the Americanization of people and institutions and created the unique character of American civilization. That's what Turner believed, and he believed it could be ascribed to the continuous, as he said, quote, evolution and adaption of organs in response to the changed environment. The existence of an area of free land, its continuous recession, and the advance of American settlement westward explain American development. And the continuous renewal of society in the western wilderness every time they push farther and farther, it helped endow the American people and their institutions with characteristics that were really exclusively American and weren't shared with the rest of the world. And what Turner is really arguing here is that the people that went west in their urban their urban uh, counterparts they they essentially planted the seeds for what we are sitting in today as modern america the history of the american frontier it's not only one of the conquest of a continent and 
one of expanding opportunity for the downtrodden. It's the history of the birth of a nation. It's endowed with characteristics that persisted through the very young days of the country and influenced its people long, long after the West itself was gone. When you think about it now, you think of the onslaught of Western movies that are still being produced today. They're even being re- remade. 310 to Yuma, uh, Magnificent Seven, I think, I mean, Tombstone's not even that old, and it's one of the best. And you you realize that there's so many aspects of this West culture and adventure type of spirit that still define us today, and it is very uniquely American, and we owe it to this migration westward. That is the frontier hypothesis in a nutshell. So how did this story of getting from the Atlantic to the Pacific really start for America? And it's kind of a muddled answer, but really when the first settlers landed, they began taking actions and setting the course that could be no longer altered eventually of continual violence, really, of the native population, the Indians in America, against the settlers who were increasingly growing more adventurous and more bold and seeking new land and opportunity to the West. To locate the best lands, the speculators turned to what they called long hunters. And for years, they had made their way through the Cumberland Gap, for example. They were exploring river valleys of Tennessee and Kentucky they blazed the Indians' tomahawk trails for settlers to then follow them. And the pioneers knew they had to move beyond the proclamation line that was near the Tennessee River. But like the white people up on the upper Tennessee River, they often would just lease land from the Indians. White hunters in search of meat didn't really bother the Indians at that time, but those that were seeking pelts did pose a serious threat to their survival because it meant that total destruction of their food source and their livelihood right before them. Despite provocation by frontier settlers, the Indians remained at peace as long as the mainly Quaker population from Pennsylvania claimed the area around the Ohio River. This was the area of Kentucky. It was one of the first settlements to open up right around the time when the United States declared its independence. Kentucky seemed pretty much open for settlement at that time. Uh, A long hunter named Daniel Boone, he opened what is called the Wilderness Road from the Halston River through the Cumberland Gap to the Kentucky River, and he established a town. And Boone's settlers, like many other pioneers, were long exposed to Indian society, and they kind of had this middle ground that they lived in between the two. It was kind of an understood peace. And during the 1770s, the frontier settlers were so they were so separated from culture and life in the settlements that they left they hardly were even aware that the united states had declared independence and there was a war going on what they were worried about was how distrustful they were of their own colonial administrators they were isolated they were self-absorbed in making homes and farms and they had almost no sense at all of the constitutional crisis that ended in the American Revolution. Most of the Western hostility aimed at the home government was centered on its failure to devise a viable policy for expansion westward and protection against Indian warfare. Once the war was over, the real violence against the Indians and the Americans took place. And it's not just because we were now free as Americans and it wasn't some bloodlust. There's a lot of revisionist history out there about the treatment and the reasoning, or at least the motives behind the treatment for the Indians. And I am certainly not a historian, but it's important to understand that there's a lot of revision going on. The main reason that the violence started was because without the British military power, the frontier lay completely open and exposed to Indian attacks, and not all of them were violent, but some were. Despite the British efforts to keep the peace on the southern part of the frontier before the war, the Cherokee by the end of 1776 immediately took up their tomahawks against the settlers on the Tennessee River. 
it was a bloody fight that was quickly followed from there, and it just added to the violence that was already happening during the American Revolution. When the exhausted Cherokee, because they were defending against what the Americans used, they they did a scorched earth type of warfare. The Cherokee sued for peace in 1777, and the Americans forced them to surrender thousands of acres of land, and there were no there was no abundance of pleasant feelings between the two sides, I guess you could say. Now, by 1780, the victories of the American army against the British had convinced American pioneers that the tides of war had shifted. They started moving back into Kentucky and Tennessee, and unfortunately, what they did not realize was that the Continental Congress lacked the money to buy the Indian neutrality or military power to compel it. The English-led Indian raiders terrorized the frontier from New York all the way down to Kentucky. The Virginians, again, relied on their military pressure and led a thousand frontiermen on a counteroffensive against the Ohio tribes. So as 1780 drew to a close, the situation on the southern frontier wasn't very favorable. So that is to say that despite the tides of war changing and Washington's army marching, there was no real peace along the frontier. And this is the point of the story where we get our first big, I guess, plot development. The Revolutionary War ends, America is independent, and Britain retreats. The outcome of the Revolutionary War had a wildly significant impact on the status of the frontier and the expansion. Great Britain had surrendered its claim to an enormous empire of land that extended from the Atlantic Ocean out to the Mississippi River and from the Great Lakes all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, obviously except for Florida, which was still controlled by Spain. Now, there was no parliament or royal officials that barred the way to what Americans saw as a virgin wilderness to explore. American officials soon learned, however, that they inherited a seemingly intractable Western slew of problems that had plagued the British. How should it be governed? How would the land be divided up? How and to whom would it be sold or given away? And perhaps the most urgent point of view, how should the Indians be pacified and ultimately removed to allow for the settlement of the white people? And as early as 1803, the United States would have its answer for the Native American population. But what's important to note also in 1803. This is very early on in the life of America. And Thomas Jefferson, he already was firmly seated with the belief that westward expansion and the economic opportunities it represented was an essential precondition for the survival of American liberty entirely. When he became president, he continued the Indian policies of earlier administrations before him, which basically aimed to convert them to a sedentary agriculture and facilitate the white settlement of the Western territories. He wrote a letter to William Henry Harrison. He titled it Peopling the West. And in this letter, he was essentially fleshing out in more detail how their plan and, well, how it was going to work and, and, you know, what they thought about it. And he said in this letter to William Henry Harrison, quote, our system is to live in perpetual peace with the Indians, to cultivate an affection, affectionate pardon me, attachment from them. By everything just and liberal, which we can do for them within the bounds of reason, and by giving them effectual protection against wrongs from our own people. He continued on to say, To promote this disposition to exchange lands, which they have to spare and we want, for necessaries, which we have to spare and they want, and he means trade with necessaries, We shall push our trading uses and be glad to see the good, as well as the influential individuals among them, run in debt, because we observe that when these debts get beyond what the individuals can pay, they become willing to lop them off by a session of lands. At our trading houses, too, we mean to sell so low as merely to repay us cost in charges, so as neither to lessen nor enlarge our capital. This is what private traders cannot do, for they must gain. They will consequently retire from competition, and we shall thus get clear of this pest without giving offense or umbrage to the Indians. So to break that up really quickly, he's essentially arguing that they're going to use the government's power to 
be able to survive without making a profit and drive down prices and get the Indians to rely on the trade. And in exchange for the trade, they will just use well, the drive down prices to get rid of any capitalistic competition, then get the Indians um, relying on their trade and their their necessities in order to use that and take land as payment. He continues and says, quote, should any tribe be foolhardy enough to take up the hatchet at any time, the seizing the whole country of that tribe and driving them across the Mississippi as the only condition of peace would be an example to others and a furtherance of our final consolidation. He goes on to say that we may be able to be present as strong a front on our western as on our eastern border and plant on the Mississippi itself the means of its own defense. I must repeat that this letter is to be considered as private and friendly and is not to control any particular instructions which you may receive through official channel. You will also perceive how sacredly it must be kept within your own breast and especially how improper to be understood by the Indians. For their interests and their tranquility, it is best they should see only the present age of their history. Now, if you read this letter in its entirety, it doesn't come off quite as antagonistic or as maleficent as I made it seem, maybe. It does have a tone of, they feel like they have, I don't know how to explain, it's a hard thing to explain, but the way that Thomas Jefferson writes this letter, you get a sense that he thinks he's doing something that not isn't the, it's not the right thing but he thinks he's doing something that isn't necessarily bad it could be wrong and there's historians that debate about it back and forth but that's essentially the action of the government and the way they felt about it for years to come after this they felt as though they had found a solution that essentially it only prolonged the inevitable and it just continued pushing the indians further west as we went further west and after a while, they ran out of land because the ocean was there. It's a difficult thing to come to terms with, and it's really, really hard to look back in, you know, it's 2018 as I'm recording this, and to look back almost 250 years ago and try to understand their logic and what was going on at the time and try to understand the different ideas about life and people that they had back then to get an idea of how and why they could have come up with a solution like this. It's very, very difficult, but it teaches us an important lesson of looking back and trying to understand why so that we won't ever repeat that mistake again. But either way, that's history. It's always a lesson. We find ourselves in 1803 Shortly after the country has been formed in the first place, an event is about to happen that is arguably one of the most pivotal events in the growth of America in its entirety. The United States more than doubled the territory that they had, and they laid the foundations for real westward expansion in the coming century through the Louisiana Purchase. Now, if you are like me, or if you were like me, when you first learned about the Louisiana Purchase, you were what, probably in middle school. And unfortunately, because of the way history is taught in schools in America, your eyes probably glossed over as much as mine did when talking about the Louisiana Purchase. Now, the importance of this purchase of land to the growth and the vitality of the nation cannot be overstated. It was in 1803. It was a total purchase of 828,800 square miles for $15 million for France. That works out to be less than three cents per acre. But if you're like me, you are terrible at math. And I had to do some uh, inflation uh, Googling to figure out just exactly what that weighed out is because $15 million in 1803 is certainly not equal to what it is today. $15 million in 1803 is equal to $2016 is the latest Google gave me 300. I'm sorry, $307,391,000 and some change that works out to $61.48 per acre, which is an amazing deal when you consider the 
bounty America has experienced because of that land and the prosperous farming and agriculture, hunting, whatever we'll get there, that came from it. Now, 6148 doesn't sound like a ton per acre, but doesn't sound like a three cent per acre steel. To give you an idea, in contrast, the average acre of land in Texas in 2016 fell a little bit to $5,647 per acre, 2016 dollars. So all weighted out, we paid $6,148 an acre, an average acre of land in Texas today is $5,647. That should give you an idea of what an amazing deal that was for us. We purchased it from France and it really opened up the, it was the spark that set off the fire of expeditions and exploration and expansion for the first real time. Now, the adventurous, Amer- the more adventurous Americans had always been pressing the borders of the frontier and exploring a little bit, but up until a point, they had to stop because it was owned by France or it was, it was just off limits. But now, all of a sudden, it seemed like it was overnight, they were able to go beyond the Mississippi River and they were able to begin not just the exploration, but the conquest of a new frontier and tame the wild continent that they were on. It was a gargantuan land of rolling prairies, long grassy plains, humongous mountains, and dry deserts. They found what they sought, fertile farming country, green pastures, precious metals like gold, and a king's fortune in a shining beaver pelts. News of the wealth that they were finding, it pretty much set the other Americans ablaze, marching westward in an ever-growing migration that continued until the director of the census could announce in 1890 that the unbroken frontier line was officially a thing of the past. The rapid and quick conquest of the area that was larger than double what was occupied during the entire two preceding centuries was enough evidence of a remarkable expansive power of Americans. But even more amazing was the fact that the advanced in the far west It required this continuous adaption to new and strange environments. It seemed like there were obstacles that were placed in the path of these westward marching pioneers that were put there by nature, and they had to be surmounted before the continent could be settled. Westerners did not come face to face with those barriers until they passed the tier of states that used to be the frontier that bordered Mississippi. And once they passed that old frontier, they caught to the new frontier. It was the Great Plains province. And one of the travelers wrote about the plains. He said, quote, The country is here spread into wide and level plains, welling like the ocean, in which the view is uninterrupted by a single tree or shrub, and is diversified only by the moving herds of buffalo. The soil consists of a light-colored earth intermixed with a large proportion of coarse gravel without sand, and is by no means as fertile as the plains lower down the Missouri. It was a province that was distinguished by certain natural characteristics and still is today. It's level or rolling surface, a general lack of forest growth. And in most areas, there's a subhuman climate and there was a noticeable lack of rainfall. It was all beneficial to a certain type of settlement, but not the one that these people at this time were looking for. The farmers and ranchers would be coming a little bit later. But the Great Plains, what they did find, supported a wide variety of animal life, which had early on lured trappers and hunters out west just for the beavers. In this day and age, beaver pelts were extraordinarily valuable. And what they found in the Great Plains were that beavers were flowing like the salmon of Capistrano, if you want to take a dumb and dumber quote out of there. And what they also found for the first time were coyotes that had the ability to scatter miles behind them, and they amazed travelers. The miserable coyotes, the creatures, they were everywhere present, ready to steal anything, living or dead, that could even possibly be eaten, and they haven't changed much. Well, they have changed today, but that's neither here nor there. In a very famous writing, after Mark Twain took a trip into the plains, he wrote about the coyotes saying, quote, 
The coyote is a living, breathing allegory of want. He is always hungry. He is always poor, out of luck, and friendless. The meanest creatures despise him, and even the fleas would desert him for a velocipede. But more abundant than the coyotes were the buffalo. And they reproduced so rapidly amongst the favorable environment that there were literally millions of buffalo just wandering in great herds, covering as much as 50 square miles of prairie at a time. These gigantic beasts were pretty poorly equipped to defend themselves from the Indians and the now hunters that were there. They had poor eyesight. They were kind of a clumsy walking gait and they had awkward movements. They were just easy prey. And it was from these buffalo that the nomads, uh, the Native American Indian tribes that kind of wandered through the plains and never really settled down, lived the nomadic life, they secured their entire slew of necessity of life, fresh or jerked, which is dried meat, clothing, bedding, tent, skins for boats, and even fuel in the form of dried dung or buffalo chips. And these buffalo sustained the nomads, and this was all being exposed explored and discovered by these settlers for the very first time. And although it was new and they were exploring, it was a part of the country they were eager to overlook and move on to the next. In his book, Ray Allen Billington, a historian, and his book is called Westward Expansion, he paints a really vivid picture of the scenery in this plains land and how the new settlers reacted to this new land they were discovering. And he says, quote, wandering bands of warlike natives, drifting herds of bellowing buffaloes, a seldom veiled sun beating down upon parched earth from blue skies, endless vistas of gray green grasslands stretching unbroken to the horizon. Those were the impressions of the great plains carried away by many American frontier travelers who ventured upon their broad surface. He continues to say, for a generation, the Great Plains were looked upon as a barrier standing between the Mississippi Valley and the fertile areas beyond to be passed over as quickly as possible. Nor did the next physiographic province to the westward prove more attractive. Along the rim of the plains rose the towering peaks and rugged rock masses of the Rocky Mountains. That giant mountain chain, which stretched along the backbone of the continent from Alaska to central New Mexico. And that was the giant panorama that I can only imagine what it looked like and to be there in their shoes that when they, those early American pioneers crossed the Mississippi River and began the conquest of the far west. It was, it was a land of magnificent views, long plains, gigantic mountain peaks, in varied Indian bands that awaited all these pioneers. But also in that land, there were fortunes and buried mineral wealth, beaver peltry. They were waiting in every stream and grasslands that offered ideal pastures. And there were fertile valleys where the amazing soil basically just needed to be touched by a man to yield up its riches. These resources lured adventurers westward during the 19th century until the conquest of the continent was completed. And the latest obstacle that they found in front of them while they were moving west was the nation of Spain. Remember, they controlled basically the entire American Southwest as we see it today, from Texas all the way to California and down into Mexico. As luck would have it, the bells that proclaimed the independence of the United States in 1776 that rang in Philadelphia, they were also the death bells of Spain's American empire. It was a chain reaction of revolution that would follow, driving Spain from the control of the vast colonies that they once established. Slowly but surely, and little by little, the lands that were north of the Rio Grande River over the next several decades were wrested away by the centuries of Spanish toil that were won for those lands until the boundaries of the infant American Republic went all the way to the Pacific but that is much, much, much further ahead. The next frontier spur was a trader's frontier. So the way that this migration worked is it, was, it wasn't just all people all at once. It was groups of people that had a common interest that were going out in different sections and portions for different reasons. 
The next big movement was a movement of traders that kind of expanded the frontier, and each group expands the frontier further and further. Between 1776 and around 1840, it was the traders that established their frontier for the western border for America. Now, like I mentioned before, Thomas Jefferson was always incredibly interested in the unknown lands beyond the Mississippi, and I took a brief break in the story to kind of describe to you the lands that they found and this mysticism that they were experiencing for the first time. But when the Louisiana Purchase was made, Thomas Jefferson was president. And as an expansionist, he felt that the United States had to locate this unrevealed bounty of riches before any other European power was tempted to settle as he sought uncomfortably close to the new American borders. So what Jefferson did was he decided it needed to be all explored. The Louisiana Purchase gave the United States and Spain essentially no border out to the West. They didn't know what was out there, and they both wanted to take over as much of the Southwest as possible. So Thomas Jefferson went to Congress, and he secured an appropriation from them for exploring expedition bound westward. Quote, even to the Western Ocean, having conferences with the natives on the subject of commercial intercourse. But his object was different than the first time he tried this and got refused. Now he had a program of pushing eastern Indians into small reservations necessitated for the discovery of the new trading areas for the American trappers. And that was the primary purpose in his mind when he selected the leaders for this expedition. Names you should have heard before. At the time, he was a 28-year-old man, Meriwether Lewis, who had a skill in wilderness that dated way back from boyhood. And William Clark, he was the younger brother of George Rogers Clark, who was a 32-year-old frontiersman and Indian fighter. Before they set out, news of the Louisiana Purchase reached America. Exploration of this newly acquired domain was a major purpose of the expedition, together with the search for fresh fur trading areas and scientific observation. It was the Lewis and Clark expedition, and it was one of the most important discoveries, I guess you could say, or most important expeditions in American history. And I think it gets glossed over a bit too briefly in more elementary history in high school, middle school, whatever. I mean, this expedition accomplished so much and it was due to the quality of its leaders, the careful preparation that Thomas Jefferson supervised and the help they got along the way. Their general plan was to follow the Missouri River to its source They were going to seek a water route all the way to Pacific and make very careful records of the geography, soil, minerals, animals, vegetation, and everything that they passed. Their instructions from the president were pretty detailed, and they were to make observations on the latitude, longitude, temperature, all the rainfall, mountains, and streams, literally everything. And the amount of careful preparation for this journey proved to be so detailed that Meriwether Lewis started on his journey so thoroughly educated in natural science that his findings became literally invaluable information for the future. So the expedition set out from the Far East on the 5th of July in 1803. They gathered a crew of 51 strapping frontiersmen that they picked up most along the way. And in the late fall, they were able to establish their winter quarters near St. Louis. They spent the cold months drilling the people that they had picked up in their frontier techniques. And how can you mention Lewis and Clark without mentioning the famous uh, imperative help that they got along the way from a talented Shoshone Indian woman named, obviously, Sacagawea or Sacagawea. She was a captive of the Dakota tribes and an unofficial member of the expedition, I guess, technically, but she served as their interpreter and her knowledge of the edible berries, the fruits, her memory of parts of the country that she hadn't even seen since she was a child, the entertainment provided by the two months old baby who made the journey strapped to her back and restraining influence that she exerted on the boisterous spirits of these wild frontiersmen. It made her one of the most valuable members of the party, and you cannot leave out the man named York. He was, as they called him, a Negro. He was a slave belonging to William Clark. York was 
a giant man, especially for this time. He was well over six feet tall and slightly over 200 pounds. And at this time, that is a gigantic man. He was a superior hunter, strong swimmer, expert with the ax and setting a pole. And he was a capable linguist who served as a additional translator in the Indian country. His principal value, though, is as it would come to be, surprisingly, was his reception by the Indian tribes that they encountered. To, to them, he was a delightful curiosity. They called him Great Medicine, and they came from miles to just stare in wonder to rub his skin with wet fingers to see if the black would come off of his skin. And he played to his audience well. He would dance with leaps and bounds that would just leave everyone who saw him in shock and awe. He was a maybe the first Western salesman, I guess you could say. And the party would push on. Their canoes slipped easily through the water, and they were off to country they had never before seen, or really had never been seen by Americans. There was plentiful game, and they were not really hungry during that time. Eventually, they'd make it to the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, where the water would move a little bit quicker and was white, moving around boulders, and was cold. But thus was the nature of a expedition you're exploring. Once at that point, Lewis and Clark were getting fairly anxious to find the Shoshone Indians because they needed to replace the supplies that were running really low and secure horses for their journey on foot across the Rockies. Day after day, they wearily toiled on without a sighting of a single native. Finally, Lewis voiced his concern that the Indians were frightened into hiding by the size of his party, so they decided to go on ahead with only a couple people in a small group, and they passed what's now called Shoshone Cove, crossed the Continental Divide at Lemmy Pass, and at last they finally had to capture two Shoshone women who consented them to lead them back to the tribal camp near the uh, head of the Salmon River. But they were so terrified they actually had to capture them, so Lewis's intuition paid off. The worst was over for them. For a time, the Indians were fairly hostile, but when a band of braves who went back to meet the main party returned with Sacagawea, all their fears were at rest, and she rushed forward, as it was said, quote, to dance and show every mark of extravagant joy. She indicated that they were of her native tribe. A week of rest, and the tired travelers were back on their way once more. They used canoes that were obtained from the natives to run the rapids of the Clearwater and Columbia Rivers, until finally, in mid-November, they stood on the banks of, quote, that ocean, the object of all our labors, the reward of all our anxieties. Winter camp was established on the banks of the Columbia River, a short distance from the sea. And there, the explorers camped for four months of drizzling rain and fog, which left their bodies weak and their nerves frayed. I can vouch for them. The Columbia River is at the southern part of Oregon, which is not even the bad part, as I have lived in Seattle. Uh, I spent two winters out there, and it's awful. It's really terrible. I don't know how else to say it. Great city, great people. The winters in that drizzle rain and fog is just beyond ridiculous. All that said, the men began their return trip in late March of 1806. And do not miss that they, they left in July of 1803. They were making their way back. They started it three years later. That's a three-year one-way trip. This was not just a leisurely hike across the country. It was a very difficult and very dangerous expedition. Eventually, they would split into two parties, one by Clark, one by Lewis. They would retrace the trails to the Three Forks where Sacagawea's guidance passed them through um, a mountain pass to the upper Yellowstone River, and that was dangerous country. It was roamed by hostile Blackfoot and Grosventry Indians, but all went well until on July 27th, Lewis's men clashed with eight Blackfoot warriors inevitably, and they ended up killing two of them. Realizing that the enraged tribe would probably be coming out in force for revenge, they immediately started east and pushed their horses at full speed for more than a hundred miles before they even thought about resting. They reached the Missouri River safely. They rejoined Clark's group a short distance below the mouth of the Yellowstone, and on September 23rd of 1806, the Lewis and Clark expedition emerged at St. Louis to end one of the most epic journeys in the history of exploration. And not only that, 
they investigated thousands of miles of unknown country. They found several usable passes through the Rockies. They made important scientific observations and established friendly relations with about a dozen Indian tribes, all at a cost to the national taxpayers of the United States of America of $38,000 plus an additional $11,000 in bonuses and land grants given to the people of the expedition. I would say that was tax money well spent given the discoveries they made and the opening up of the West that those two men in that party did. It's a truly remarkable and cannot be overstated how important that was to the culture and the the life of America and the way with which Americans thought of themselves and how they got this fire, this thirst for adventure out of the blue after reading about this expedition. And it was really the beginning of the American wild West. The scientific discoveries that the expedition made set off the onslaught of the traders expanding into the frontier. It was the first time that the rendezvous system was used. And it also marked the typical frontier culture of colorful era in America's fur trading history. We'll put it that way. So until 1840, most of the trappers were settled up in the mountains and they'd spend all their days in basically an endless search for uh, untrapped beaver streams. And each year at the end of the spring hunt, they would turn their steps toward the agreed upon spot where they would meet a caravan from St. Louis that was loaded with necessities that the forest couldn't provide guns, ammunition, tobacco, alcohol, The rendezvous system, as they called it, succeeded because it blended the white man's desires, as one historian called it, for furs with the traditions and customs of the Indians. It was a comparable trade fair, and it had been staged annually by the Shoshone Indians as a means of attracting white traders to their villages. Now, certainly the rendezvous was geared towards the psychology of the Western Indians. It elevated trading from a purely commercial to more of a social function. And that's what really kicked off the, like I said, one of the most colorful eras in the long history of America's fur trading industry. And not only that, it also marked a psychological characteristic of these frontiersmen of this alone loner wild man type of style so during the time there would be hundreds of trappers and they would live continuously in the mountains they were nearly native themselves and they felt more at home amidst the silent forests or the indian villages than near their fellow men. And each year, these mountain men, as they were called, emerged from their winter camps as soon as the spring sun would thaw the streams and snow that had been trapped until July, and they made their way to the rendezvous point for their yearly contact with civilization. And it was at that point when the flat casks of alcohol were opened and the lethal fluid was passed around, it would turn the rendezvous into a scene of roaring debauchery. And during the next few days, the mountain men would drink and gamble away their entire year's earning before the caravan started eastward again. Its owners were richer by the profits that sometimes reached 2,000%, and the trappers wandered away into the forest to rest a few more weeks until the fall hunt began. The historian Ray Allen Billington writes of these men by saying, quote, What a remarkable crew of robust, self-exiled individuals those mountain men were. Some were well-educated, a few were hardened degenerates who crossed the Mississippi with a sheriff at their heels. Most of them were under 30, all preferred the forced solitudes to the regulated society of white America. Some were Negroes who found in the untamed West escape from the prejudices that made their lives miserable in the East. These were all people that were escaping the norms of the Eastern urban society, and it was a mark of the typical characteristics of these frontier settlers that you would find. They were often loners. They were often uh, degenerate, uh, what one historian called them, degenerate entrepreneurs failing over and over and over again, or just people who always thought hope was across the next ridge. And for one reason or the other, out of their control, always, they couldn't quite get there. It was a unfortunate chapter of the 
expansion story, but it is interesting that it drew all those people there together because not everyone in America just up and went west. It was a very rigorous journey, and it it required a certain type of person with a very specific drive to even consider doing it in the first place. But by the 1840s, the traders had played their role in the frontier story. Uh, By this time, the mountain men and these sun-darkened plainsmen were moving on. They deprived the Indians of any sort of self-sufficiency and made them accustomed to the goods of the white man. However, they did find the South Pass, and they discovered important highways such as the Snake River route into Oregon, Humboldt River Trail into California, and the Gila River Road to the Southwest. What they did bring back was the word of fertile valleys hidden beyond the mountains, word of distant grasslands where cattle could be grazed and fattened, and of tempting lands that were, as they saw it, weakly held by despised neighbors. The traders opened the gates of the West for the settlers to follow, and they would follow soon on those same trails right across the continent. As the settlers began to follow in the footsteps of the traders, the need for land presented them with a familiar challenge, I guess you could say. The idea of what to do with the Indians that were there. And what dawned on the government officials soon after uh, the Louisiana Purchase, and it gained a lot of popularity after the War of 1812, it was a concept called the Permanent Indian Frontier. It was somewhere the Indians could be forever removed from the path of the advancing settlements. By this time, they had enough knowledge that just east of the Rocky Mountains, the men of that day who had explored there knew of a desolate region unfit for any, as they saw, white habitation. A man named Zebulon M. Pike, as what an awesome name, uh, he returned from an 1806 exploration and he painted an unforgettable picture of the barrenness. He said, quote, I saw on my route in various places tracks of many leagues where the wind had thrown up the sand in all the fanciful forms of the ocean's rolling waves and on which not a speck of vegetable matter existed. Stephen H. Long, uh, a later explorer, he named that gen- that area the Great American Desert. And this, the officials agreed, was unfit to foster a home for transplanted eastern tribes, but should be reserved for the Plain Indians already there. If all the Indians from the east of the Mississippi could be removed there, valuable lands would be opened up to the pioneers, friction between two races removed, and the natives protected from the sins and the diseases of the white men. And that was at least the argument of the government. Either way, for the next 15 years, the work of persuading eastern tribes to accept homes along the Indian frontier trotted along. Usually, agents would bribe some of corrupt chief into signing a removal treaty, and then it would force the entire tribe to move west. The Shawnee of Ohio were first to go to a 25-mile wide strip south of the Kansas River. In quick succession, pardon me, other tribes of the old northwest, such as the Kickapoo, the Sauk, Fox, Chippewa, Iowa, Potawatomi, Ottawa, Peoria, and Miami tribes were all crowded into small reserves just west of the 95th meridian, or in a few instances, onto lands in western Iowa. By the year 1840, the permanent Indian frontier was planted along the 95th meridian from the Red River to the Great Bend of the Missouri. In their reservations and on the Great Plains just beyond, the Indians were, in theory, to spend the rest of their time free from molestation of whites. See, because they were doing them a favor. Basic to the removal policy was the belief that the natives would obtain food, clothing from buffalo hunts, or farming without aid from the government because they were so kind. Congress did seek to secure economic isolation by two laws, one in 1834 that was created by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It forbade all white men except properly licensed traders to enter the reservations. Those measures signified official determination to let the Indians shift for themselves. Two things doomed this policy to failure from the beginning. One was in the inability of the eastern native tribes that they plucked out of their environment to adapt to this strange new one of the plains. And just as fatal as the failure of the two groups of natives living in the west, the intruded Indians and the plains Indians, 
to live together peacefully. The Easterners scorned their wandering brethren of the prairies as primitive barbarians, and the Western looked down at the newcomers as interlopers on land that was rightfully theirs. And for the next half dozen years, there were log and mud outposts that had to stand guard over thousands of miles of Indian country, where there were constant efforts required to keep the enraged Indians from going at each other's throats. Fear of federal troops, rather than the acceptance of the reservation system, eventually would keep the hostile forces apart, at least for a little bit. And in that piece, the United States managed to take away most of Iowa and the tribes signed over the entire territory of Minnesota to the United States. On the other side of things, the colonizers were moving into the Mississippi Valley frontier in droves. They were ideal colonizers. They were bold. They blustered their way into the lands of Spain and England earlier. And life on the water, it attracted a higher percentage of I don't know how else to say arrogant, foolhardy, uh, bragging egotists that could be found on any other frontier. The work they did, which was like manning keel boats, they would dig lead from the mines. They would clear away forests, till soil. It placed a premium on brawn rather than their brains. The one boast of Westerners what they was that they daily performed tasks that could have broken lesser men. So they developed this vainful, boastful pride in their strength. And throughout the valley, every man was as good as the next and considered himself to be a whole lot better. And recipe for disaster when such arrogance is kind of injected into an already turbulent society, the result was chaos. Most of the settlers, though, were orderly citizens. They were bent on improving their lot by legal means and as disapproving of lawlessness as their counterparts are today. Yet the image that characterizes this frontier more than any other is one of misfits, extroverts, brawlers, and gamblers. Most of this group went about heavily armed despite laws in every community against carrying those very weapons they were arming themselves with. The lower class and poor would arm themselves with bowie knives or daggers tucked into the boot tops. The elite and upper class would have more dignified instruments of mayhem, if you will, such as uh, sword canes or a dirk. The sole object in these fights that would always break out was to incapacitate the opponent and no holds were barred. The scene of one fight left a shocked traveler in so much dismay, dis, uh, despair, sorry, he wrote down the his take of the fight and how brutal they were. He said, quote, When two men quarrel, they never have an idea of striking, but immediately seize upon each other and fall and twist each other's thumbs or fingers into the eye and push it from the socket until it falls on the cheeks. As one of those men experienced today and was obliged to acknowledge himself beat, although he was on top of the other. But he, in his turn, had bit his adversary most abominably. In turn, what would happen is the survivors of these eye-gouging, nose-biting battles would feel proud of themselves. Their talk was of their skill with the rifle, their prowess in battle, their strength. You could hear them say, quote, I'm the darling branch of old Kentuck that can eat a painter, hold a buffalo out to drink, and put a rifle ball through the moon. And then another one would shout up and say, I can wade the brown Mississippi, jump the Ohio, step across the Nolichucky river, I guess, ride a streak of lightning, slip without a scratch down a honey locust tree, whip my weight in wildcats, and strike a blow like a falling tree. They boasted they could outshoot, outride, outdrink, outfight any man in all creation ever and forever. Amen. And they could bluster their way into any man's nation with such assurance that no one really stopped them. They made excellent colonizers. They respected neither God nor man. They were proud of their country and disdainful for all other nations. As strong as the whiskey they drank and as brave as they actually pretended to be, they didn't fear animals. They didn't fear Indians. They didn't fear white-skinned Europeans who blocked their path either. They brushed aside obstacles as casually as they bragged of gouging out the eyes or ears of the frontier men that was next to them. They carried the frontier westward in a series of dramatic moves— that added Texas, Oregon, the Great Basin, and California to the United States. So although it was not the prettiest of frontiers and settlers, they 
helped in such a way to gain the entire rest of the country almost. And they probably did have a great deal to contribute to the American bravado that's normally associated with an American personality. In the quarter century that followed, 1825, next 25 years, it witnessed the most remarkable burst of expansion in the history of the United States. In that time, the United States would annex Texas into the Union. Well, technically, it's a republic of its own, but semantics. The way that that happened, while generalizing and skipping over a lot of details just for time's sake, was really started in December of 1835. In San Antonio, there was a garrison of troops led by Santa Ana, and for some months they had been under siege by the native Texans, and that garrison surrendered. Its officers were made to swear that they would support the Constitution of 1824 and agree never to enter Texas again as a condition of their release. Now, for those of the soldiers that accepted that proposition, they were given an alternative option as well. They could remain in Texas as long as they joined the Federalist cause. Santa Ana himself correctly perceived that these conditions would be pretty dangerous. Unless he acted at once, Texas would become the rallying center for Federalists from all northern Mexico. He formed an army, and he placed himself in command, and he started toward Texas. Unwittingly, he had taken on the course that would convert the Texans from Mexican Federalists to revolutionaries themselves. For a time, there was just utter chaos. Santa Ana was reigning with almost 6,000 men, and he was advancing completely unchecked all the way towards San Antonio. There was a small force of just 187 men waiting behind the adobe walls of the Alamo Mission in San Antonio, Texas, to bar his path. These brave men, they were mostly Texans, but there were men from all over the country. There were two or three from South Carolina that are named, their names are plastered all over the state with roads and and memorials. They laid down their lives for the cause. And in a very impressive feat, they managed to kill 1,544 soldiers before they were killed. Their deaths touched off a spark of resentment all over the nation. The rallying cry became, remember the Alamo. And not even the most sluggish of Americans could resist from getting caught up in sweeping patriotism. In this electrified atmosphere, men of all shades of opinion, they agreed that independence was their only recourse. Stephen F. Austin himself publicly declared for separation from Mexico. So a constitution for the Republic of Texas was fashioned by a judicious borrowing of concepts and phrases from the United States Constitution in several states that the delegates knew. It provided for a president who would serve a three-year term and not be eligible for re-election, an elected Congress, and a judicial system similar to the U.S. Slavery was legalized, and each Texan was granted a league and labor of land. And that's the story of the Alamo in a brief nutshell, and the story of how Texas became part of the Union. And it is important to note that that was a humongous... I mean, look at a map of... Texas and you can you can google and overlay it on the size of Texas versus other countries it's a massive massive plot of land but what that really did was it helped extend the boundaries of the United States physically obviously but mentally as well now we had this massive chunk of land all of the sudden and Mexico's claim to that area was diminished greatly it really promoted a lot more of these cowboy southwestern western type of expansion and wild west american migration and again it goes to show you the pioneer instinct that the united states citizens and the people of america they all had it was this strong bent of human spirit this desire to blaze trails accept a difficult challenge and experience the thrill of opening up a new country just as the long hunters had been doing in the Kentucky wilderness before then. Oregon was the next state to experience a fever of migration. And as early as 1843, there were no less than a thousand people converging at independence, Missouri that spring, getting ready to start the drive West driving 5,000 cattle and oxen. And keep in mind, this is 
right, this is 20 years before the Civil War. I think a lot of the history of the American expansion West gets, it doesn't get lost, but there's so much to it that it kind of is difficult to keep in the back of your head while you're reading and learning all this stuff that this is not a a long, you know, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far away. This was just before the Civil War, and we always consider that the West before the Civil War, if you take into account the Civil War, it kind of glosses over the fact that half of the country wasn't really populized yet, but it was starting that way. And just like the American Revolution and the the pioneers before them, there were people way out West who almost had no idea the Civil War was going on because they were living, like I said, with the quotes of those pioneer men, on their own, almost as if they were part of the wilderness themselves. It's a really fascinating thing to keep in the back of your head of what it must have been like to just be a pioneer. If any of you are around my age, you'd remember probably the best educational, I guess you could say, video game probably ever created, the Great Oregon Trail. That's the inspiration for this period of expansion. We know what it was like thanks to the people who wrote down and preserve that experience so we can experience it in some form later on. Jesse Applegate wrote of his experiences on that great cattle drive out to Oregon, and he wrote about how they pulled up the wagons in a a form of stockade or corral, and he said, quote, the wagons were, I'm sorry, quote, a circle 100 yards deep formed with wagons connected strongly with each other, the wagon in the rear being connected with the wagon in front by its tongue and ox chains. It is a strong barrier that the most vicious ox cannot break, and in case of attack from the Sioux, would be no contemptible entrenchment. At this time, though, the fear of the Indians were misplaced in this this region, for in the early years of the plains travel, the Indians there proved more curious than they were dangerous. We know that because of bitter experience in the past, the members of these expeditions had been taught that baggage should be reduced to a minimum. The eastern portion of the Oregon Trail was strewn about with furniture and equipment that had been discarded because it was too burdensome. They discovered that wagons must be rugged and durable and that the oxen were preferable to horses as draft animals and much less attractive to the Indians. That great migration of 1843, it proved to be a turning point in the history of Oregon and the country itself. People were extremely skeptical that it would be successful in the least bit. Even Horace Greeley wrote, quote, this migration of more than 1,000 persons in one body to Oregon wears an aspect of insanity. But despite that great pep talk, those ranchers made it out to Oregon and they found success in pioneering. And even though the migrations themselves differed independently, there was a two-century period where they followed a frontier advance pattern. It was whenever conditions, wherever they were at home, held little promise and the regions that they saw ahead of them were attractive enough, a vast and rapid westward movement took place. In each case, these people were risking the uncertainties of dangerous travel to settle on rich lands, which promised them the prosperity that they had failed to find in the East. Now, keep in mind that this was a frontier surge where American pioneers were crossing Texas into the valleys of California as well, and to imagine that it would go on without protest, was simply naive. Those were, at that time, Mexican territories. They had been won by the blood and sweat of the early conquerors. They had been viewed as generations as an essential barrier against aggressive intrusion from the U.S. Public opinion in Mexico insisted that the northern provinces never should be surrendered. Public opinion north of the border was almost as united in support of annexing California. And that was the foundation for the conflict which began in 1846 and ended only when a triumphant U.S. wrested from its beaten opponent not only California, but the whole region north of the Gila and Rio Grande rivers. Now, the causes that impelled both nations to the Mexican-American War, they were far from simple, but for brevity's sake, we're not going to dive too far into it. The most simple answer I could give is that it was the people not being honest with themselves and the government not being honest with the intentions of both peoples. If you had been there that day, every patriot who was clamoring for the provinces of Mexico to join the U.S., they would have denied 
their desire to exploit a neighbor's territory. But the righteous, although ill-informed people of that day, they sincerely believed that their democratic institutions were of the most magnificent perfection that there were simply no boundaries that could contain them. It wasn't imperialism. It was a form of enforced salvation. The term manifest destiny might ring a bell or two from the old days of history in, in school. And that was really the idea that was being spread in mass throughout the nation at this time. Manifest destiny was almost like the domino theory of Vietnam. It gave the people a ideology to justify what their desires were, whether or not they were even honest with themselves about those desires. Now, regardless of the ideology used or the way that people felt about it at the time, the United States and Mexico were at war. The first blow was struck by the Mexican commander named General Mariano Arista, who on May 8th of 1846, just five days before the war was officially declared, took his army across the Rio Grande in the hope of opening up the road to Louisiana by defeating General Taylor, who Arista assumed wouldn't expect the attack. But General Taylor was on to his ruse, and he met the invaders, and the two battles that ensued were fought at Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma. He defeated them in both battles, General Taylor did, and he drove them right back across the river. And what President Polk at the time chose to define as American soil was freed of the enemy. The president could turn then to a long-range plan for the defeat of Mexico. There were two objectives in this strategy mapped out by President Polk and his military advisors, and the first one was to win the northern Mexican provinces. And on the day that the war was declared, he told his cabinet, quote, In making peace with our adversary, we shall acquire California, New Mexico, and other further territory as an indemnity for this war if we can. The second objective, which is easier said than done, was just to end the struggle as quickly as possible. The war ended in March of 1848, and the United States experienced massive territorial gains from the victory in that war. And those gains, they showed the divide of the two people in the United States. There were those who desired a mass expansion and land gain of the United States, and then there were the rabid advocates of the Manifest Destiny. And those gains, for a brief period, were enough to satisfy all but those most extreme advocates of that. The United States, by acquiring Texas, Oregon, the Southwest, and California, added 1,200,000 square miles to its domains. It virtually doubled its territory again and extended its boundaries all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And because of those new boundaries, the men out in California in 1848 hurled the nation into a fever pitch at the news of the workmen who discovered flakes of a dull yellow metal in a mill race that they were constructing on the lands of John A. Souter. And by mid-March of 1848, the news was out that there was gold in California. It was the beginning of the nation's greatest gold rush. The news brought forth an exciting story of neglected shops and abandoned farms throughout California, of shiftless loafers washing out $50 worth of gold a day in Northern California with just a shovel and a dishpan. It told of fabulous strikes of gold following another fabulous strike of gold and the fortunes that were awaiting anyone who cared to pan the American River or the other streams that flowed west from the Sierra Nevadas into Sacramento Valley. When President Polk incorporated the reports in his December report of 1848 in a message to Congress, the whole country, and the whole world for that matter, went gold mad, and the rush to California was on. And this was the next real pioneer expansion of the United States. It wasn't done by hunters or trappers. It wasn't done by settlers. This time it was done by the 49ers in hope for gold. Now on this journey, it was a journey of intense suffering. These people had no idea what they were doing out in these plains land, and if they did, it was information that they got from equally ignorant guidebook writers or newspaper editors. On the trails across the plains, the diseases that lurked in every muddy waterhole took a toll of 5,000 lives. Those who wandered from the popular paths, they frequently succumbed to starvation. In the Rocky Mountains, more fell prey to dysentery or mountain fever, as they struggled up towards street, steep trails pardon me, 
with overloaded wagons and no idea what they were doing. By autumn of 1849, skeletons of dead horses and cattle lined the side of the road for hundreds of miles, while unmarked graves of humans were appallingly plentiful. Yet the worst trials lay ahead of them, where the steep slopes of the Sierra Nevada mountain range reached skyward across the path of those 49ers. The weary immigrants often abandoned their wagons or they ate starving pack animals as they sought the strength to surmount those seemingly uncrossable barriers. Others would perish in the snow-packed passes, or if they sought around a route around the southern tip of the mountains, they would wander into the dread of Death Valley. It was a region that one of the travelers called, quote, dreadful sands and shadows, salt columns, bitter lakes, a wild, dreary, sunken desolation. It was a group of people who were mingled together, such as Missouri farmers, Yankee sailors, Georgia peanut farmers, not Jimmy Carter, English shopkeepers, French peasants, everyone. They were all drawn to California by the promise of gold. And so throughout the late 50s and 1860s, they scoured the entire domain. They panned every likely stream and scanned each rock for the telltale glint of that yellow metal. Few of them would operate alone um, because the danger of Indians and outlaws was always present. The solitary prospector with his mule and washing pan, that was kind of an invention of the 20th century Hollywood romanticism of the gold rush. On this frontier, as on all the others before it, group cooperation was essential to both success and survival. It should be worth noting that very few of the men who were out there even knew how to mine. The gold was locked in quartz veins that could only be crushed with expensive machinery, the gold that was worth it at least. So they spent their days staking out claims, their night peddling shares in imaginary mines. Everyone was feverishly happy in the land of penniless millionaires. But they all knew they could just feel it. They had gold in their future, regardless of how rational that logic was or not. It was actually Mark Twain's own experiences in the minds of these gold rushing decades that followed the 1840s that gave him the inspiration for his classic book called Roughing It, which was a description of life in the far, far West. Now, the important thing to note about this gold rush is aside from the wealth and the actual expansion of people, what it did was it strengthened a demand for territorial organization, which forced Congress to set aside Western Utah as the Nevada Territory in 1861. And right then was when the Civil War broke out and the priorities, we could say, of Congress were sidetracked for the moment. The way in which the rapid desire to go out west was suddenly forced upon America, it had a pretty alarming effect for both the east and the west of the United States. In the past, they knew that pioneer communities were so near settled regions, their economic and spiritual needs could be supplied by the older society. Now, the miners were living in isolated islands of settlements that were scattered here and there over the mountainous array of the west, where they were very distant from the civilization of the east. If they were left to themselves, they might drift into what the east was worried of godless pagan practices detrimental to the nation. For their salvation's sake, they would argue, and the country's fate, it depended on the rapid development of transportation lines within the states. As well, the prospectors out there were equally insistent on better communications, knowing that the roads would mean lower commodity prices for mining camps and more frequent news of happenings in the East. The end result of all of this was the pressure on Washington that forced Congress to grant a series of subsidies between the middle 1850s and 71 to express companies, stagecoach lines, telegraph corporations, and railroads. This federal aid that was supplied, it not only gave the people and societies of the West the economic outlets they needed, but it opened vast portions of the continent that were previously unaccessible to a new opportunity of settlement. It should really go without saying that the need for a transcontinental railroad at this time 
was pretty much acknowledged by anyone in the country by the mid-1850s, and the nation began to visualize for the first time a Pacific Road in January of 1845 when a New York businessman and China trader named Asa Whitney proposed to Congress that the government grant a 60-mile strip between Lake Superior and the Oregon country to any company willing to risk the construction. They hired two companies, and on July 1st of 1862, Congress passed a law that officially launched the first Pacific Railroad. The first track began to be laid in 1863, and it inched forward ever so slowly during the next few years. They laid a total of 20 miles in the year of 1864, then another 20 in 1865. They laid 30 in 66. They laid 46 miles of track in 1867. So I think the the transcontinental railroad story that we learned growing up, it's glossed over a bit because we just are under the assumption that a big railroad was made. And we have a difficult time understanding that it took a year, an entire year for a company, a rail company to build 20 miles of track. It's incredible to realize the amount of effort that had to be put into this project, but also the amount of expansion and the industrial success that it led to. This is a phenomenal example in history of a government subsidizing a project that leads to unbelievable success. Now, they don't always lead to that, but this is the way it looks when it's done correctly. And laying track was by no means an easy task to do. We have an account of one of the workers who wrote, quote, A light car drawn by a single horse gallops up to the front with its load of rails. Two men seize the end of a rail and start forward, the rest of the gang taking hold by twos until it is clear of the car. They come forward at a run. At the word of command, the rail is dropped in its place, right side up with care, while the same process goes on the other side of the car. Less than 30 seconds to a rail for each gang, and so four rails go down to the minute. The moment the car is empty, it is tipped over on the side of the track to let the next loaded car pass it, and then it is tipped back again. It is a sight to see it go flying back for another load, propelled by a horse at full gallop, at the end of 60 or 80 feet of rope ridden by a young man driving furiously. Close behind the first gang comes the gougers, spikers, and bolters, and a lively time they make of it. It is a grand anvil chorus that these sturdy sledges are playing across the plains. And so these men swept across the continent in a symphony of iron motion. The competition was furious between the two companies that were building from the east and from the west towards the middle. And in mid-May of 1869, they finally watched the last placing of the silver-bound laurel tie that fixed the last steel rail and the presentation of the golden spike that bound the two railroads together. And that was a night of great celebration in the United States. There was a seven-mile-long procession in Chicago. New York hung out a uh, hundred guns, and they held Thanksgiving services in Trinity. Philadelphia even rang the Liberty Bell. It was a sign of a war-torn people cheering on the forging of a new nation bond of union rather than the chaos and civil war that had reigned just a few years before that. It was not just a massive logistical feat that opened up that side of things for America, but it was a, it was more than just a binding of railroads. It really felt to them like the country was back together the way it should be. And so the great mining frontier and the spread of a transportation network across the Great Plains had pushed the American frontier ever so further. But it also pushed the United States once more into a puzzle that they had not quite solved yet. It was the Indian puzzle. And what should be done with the natives who roamed the prairies and hunted in the mountain valleys that were so coveted by those men? What followed was the downright blundering attempts of insensitive federal officials to answer that question, and they plunged the West into a period of warfare, which only ended when the beaten Native Americans, beaten power, and their spirit broken were crowded onto reservations where they no longer blocked the westward march of settlers. Those Indian homelands were taken in those post-Civil War years, but they were taken at a cost of blood, wealth, 
and a cost of human decency that unfortunately was so characteristic of the American frontier experience. The largest difference between this era of Indian-U.S. relations than the past was that this time it was not a chivalrous or a misguided sense of decency that they were just pushing them out with. This time, it was won and lost with blood. In the bloodiest battle of the entire Indian warfare or struggle, in November 28th of 1864, Colonel Shivington led his men from Fort Lyon and surrounded the camp of 500 unsuspecting Native American Indians led by Chief Black Kettle while they slept peacefully. And at the first streak of light across the plains, the militia charged in and they rushed upon the confused Indians, firing and tomahawking them as they went. And in vain, Chief Black Kettle raised first an American flag and then a white flag. But it had really little effect. The disordered Indians were driven across the camp, down into a dry bed of a creek nearby, and their backs were against a high bank on the other side, and they were trapped. In one of the saddest stories of human carnage, even the women and children who sought refuge in the caves there were later dragged out to be shot, killed, and knifed. A watching trader said that they were, quote, scalped, their brains knocked out, the men used their knives, ripped open women, clubbed little children, knocked them in the head with their guns, beat their brains out, mutilated bodies in every sense of the word. And within a few hours, the battered corpses of 450 Indians covered that battleground. And that would be the end of the Chivington Massacre, and it accomplished little in a tactical sense of the word. I think the important thing to take from this period of our actions in the past and America's official strategies of Indian relocation and what happened, the important thing to glean from this is that, again, there's a lot of revision today that this was just a very flippant or casual reaction and that it didn't mean much and that we had no guilt at the time. And that's simply just not the case. A lot of people today want to make it seem like it was just bloodlust that took us there and we had no care for them as people at all. Now, to be fair, that was the case with some people. I think it always will be the case. Human beings are a very flawed being. But to say that it was a unanimous decision and that everyone slept well at night because of it is simply not true. This was a period that the American people were plunged into that was wrought with gloomy soul searching. And there was critics pointing out that such slaughter called for a thorough investigation of the entire Indian administration. The famous paper with the name of the nation had a staunch line saying, quote, our whole Indian policy is a system of mismanagement and in many parts, one of gigantic abuse. Unfortunately, the violence would continue into one of the most Famous instances of tragic failure of leadership in American warfare to date. It was a battle that was contained within the Sioux Wars of 1875 to 76, and it was really the last war that the nation needed to force the northern tribes into submission. Although this time the Americans weren't the instigators of the war, the Sioux tribe were, the Americans had done very little to placate their fears. The natives were aroused by the, the rampant corruption in the Department of the Interior, and they complained that supplies promised to the Black Hills Reservation were too few and consisted of moldy flour, spoiled beef, blankets that had already been eaten by moths, and other Indians were simply alarmed by the steady advance of the Northern Pacific Railroad that was going directly towards their territory. When negotiations broke down in the autumn of that year, the United States pretty much washed its hands of the matter entirely. They poured in by the tens of the thousands that winter after they just opened the Indian lands to any miners who dared to risk the wrath of mining there. It was little wonder that the Indians were ready to fight by the spring of 76. The conflict was one that was began by the authorities of the tribes. They knew that a lot of the younger braves had been slipping away from the reservation to join the bands of the non-treaty Indians, those that didn't agree to sign the treaties with the United States right away, in the country that was east of the Bighorn. 
And fearing trouble, they ordered all the Sioux Indians, regardless of any treaty guarantees that allowed them to hunt on the northern plains, to return to the reserve. But two leaders of the Dakota, the Teton Dakota tribe, named Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, they not only refused to return, but they started collecting supplies on the Little Bighorn River, and they had every indication that they meant to fight. And the problem was dumped on the United States Army in March of 76 that kicked off the New Indian War. U.S. Army scouts reported that they found a large band of Indians that had crossed the Rosebud River on its way to Sitting Bull's headquarters, which was located on the Little Bighorn. General Terry, who is a commander of the force, devised a pretty sensible campaign right away. One of his subordinates, the irrepressible and notorious George A. Custer of the Southern Plains War fame, was sent south along the Rosebud River to track those Indians to their campsite, then swing his command around them so they couldn't retreat into the Bighorn Mountains. And his strategy would have been fine, it would have succeeded. But there was one unpredictable factor, and that was the recklessness of Custer himself. He was a colorful commander, to say the least. He was a vain and foolhardy leader. He was immature, and he was beset with inner conflicts that could only be compensated by a ultra-glory-seeking bravado in swagger. Most dangerously, though, he had a chip on his shoulder. He was hurting still from an insult that had happened a while ago that was a public rebuke from President Grant for testifying against his brother in a case involving fraudulent Indian trading practices, and he was looking to regain his self-esteem by some feat of valor as he saw it. And it was in that mood that he was approaching the Sioux tribe camp on the Little Bighorn. And on the morning of June 25th, 1876, he ordered in advance. Custer led a band of 265 men that moved very cautiously forward until the skirmishing between them and the Indians began at noon. His scouts came back and reported that some of the natives were fleeing, so he swung his command toward the village. As he did this, the Sioux tribe swept upon him. Instead of surprising a small Indian camp, he had stumbled upon the Sioux tribe's main encampment where 2,500 warriors were lying in wait. He was quickly surrounded and poured into with absolutely devastating fire as the Indian tribe surged around the ever-thinning cluster of soldiers. And within just a few hours, it was all over. Custer and his column, they lay dead on the battlefield, and a similar fate for the remaining columns was narrowly averted by a hasty retreat with the pack train and the timely arrival of General Terry with the main army. It was the Battle of the Little Bighorn. It was known as Custer's Last Stand, and it was a dramatic and costly defeat. It was all brought to an end when the Battle of Wounded Knee had been fought and marked the end of the military conquest of the Indians of the Far West with a tragic end. For 30 years, the United States had pretty much seen fit to kill and subdue an entire segment of its people whose only crime, in air quotes, was an insistence on maintaining their cultural identity rather than assimilate into the white social order. The Indians were victims of the age in which they lived. With the momentum of expansion that was so well established, and with the national manifest destiny to control the continent clearly, anyone who stood in the way of race conquest were doomed. Now, remember earlier in this episode, I mentioned that the Native American Indians in that area, and for most most part, all of them, they insisted on the buffalo to survive. They used it for almost every aspect of their life. And one of the things that aided to the demise of the Indian population was not that they were an inferior military. A lot of times, I think people have the notion that the United States was a overpowering, overpowering and overbearing force that the Indians just simply couldn't even kid themselves into thinking they could win. That was not true. The Indians were a incredibly skilled military people. They were aided, the United States was, by an unforeseen circumstance that really tipped the scales in their favor. And it was the extermination of the buffalo by professional hunters. And when those buffalo began to vanish, so did the Indians' livelihood. And they had no choice but to accept a federal bounty. The best estimates for the buffalo population out there before the hunters started thinning out the herds is in the millions of populations. We can't know for sure, but 
they quickly vanished. They were just an easy hunt. They might have survived the onslaught, but a Pennsylvania tannery discovered in 1871 that the buffalo hides could be used for commercial leather. That meant every bison was worth a dollar to three dollars. Professional hunters began swarming the plains to exploit this new source of wealth. Between 1872 and 1874, millions of those beasts were killed every year, and the rate of the slaughter was only increased as the companies began to hire bands of hunters to go out into the field. There'd be a group of eight or nine of them. They were armed with rifles and accompanied by wagons to carry out the hides. They could kill and skin 50 or more bison a day. By 1878, the southern herd was exterminated. That is only a period of four years. In 1883, the buffalo vanished entirely from the Northern Plains region. There was an expedition led by a, uh, or funded by a museum that was seeking specimens that year, and they found less than 200 in all the West. While 1903 rolled around, the number of bison in the nation had dwindled down to a total of 34 bison. So it's no wonder that the Indians, with their entire staff of life taken from them, were forced to accept a servile fate as wards of the government. And because they had been forced into that role, the whole of the West was open to the ranchers and just the townsfolk and settler type of frontier people that were really the last frontier expansion of the United States. And because of that, they were able to have people out there that were inventors and scientists and just general tradesmen. And it brought about an industrial revolution to the United States. And that industrial revolution is the thing that most historians would point to as the final chapter of the frontier expansion in America's history. After the uh, pardon me, industrial revolution kicks off, the United States is kind of kicked towards the modern age. And really, the beginning of World War I, I guess, is probably the best hard close you could put on the frontier. The beginning of World War I marks an absolute modern era of the world. But at that point, it wasn't just actions within the United States that did that. All said and done, there's almost no doubt at all that westward expansion was a vital part of the post-revolutionary American utopia dream. It didn't mean that everyone wanted or even could go west. There were explorers, traders, and settlers, and the adventurers. They were from every stripe, class, and race, but pioneering itself was a selective process. It appealed to the people that were less than secure, to the contemplative and the cautious over the restless, and to the venturesome and the high-risk takers. There's little doubt that courage was the foundational requirement to trade the comforts and certainties of the home that they were already in for the hazards of the entirely unknown frontier. Regardless of who these people were before they went to the the frontier, they became a group of people that contained certain self-perpetuating traits and attitudes. Children that were reared on the frontier environment, they were moved often. They'd have a greater tendency towards mobility than those who spent their childhood at their ancestral home. And they would in turn infect their own children with a desire and acceptance for change. So the attitudes of those frontier people began to be passed along from a generation to a generation, and it continued. And it still influences the national behavior of today in the same way that popular culture has always depicted the West as a land of promise. It would be the pioneer's faith and hard work, progress, and the nation's vast wealth of resources and its economic and political institutions that convinced Westerners that the United States would be the greatest power in the world. Americans boasted tirelessly about the nation's military and economic prowess, and this aggressive sense of nationalism was heightened by the frontier habit of moving around, which lessened the attachments to the local, and it forced the Westerners to rely on the federal government to help them serve their needs. There was an ardent frontier type of nationalism that swept across America and was representative of much of the United States during the 19th century, and it was in no small part from the pioneer 
expansion of the West. And I guess the biggest takeaway of the entire frontier era of the United States is that although it ended well over a century ago today, it has important messages for the future. The hardy and self-reliant women and men who over three centuries conquered a continent have played their role in this drama of American development. It is not an era that should be dismissed as an era of evil. But this era also helps us to recognize that in the future, just as in the past, individuals have to have opportunities for self-advancement, but that the strong desires of some of those individuals, regardless of how productive they may appear, they don't transcend the requirements of societies. And it's no surprise at all that the future of America after the frontier era was incredibly dependent on the actions of the past. In that way, in order to sustain their future, America had to retain their sense of optimism, their profound faith in themselves, willingness to innovate, and their trust in democracy. And it all comes full circle to that frontier hypothesis put forth by Turner that the frontier experience of America characterized the spirit of Americans all the way to today, and it will continue to do so in the future. Although there was separate groups of people that went out in different chunks of times that marked a character migration of the frontier and expansion west in their own little divided sections of history and decades, they were still a group of American people. And it was the combined sharing of all the actions, the success, all the difficulties and the trials along the way of expanding the American frontier from all those different people that came together and they shared those experiences and they grew upon that. And they grew upon that into the American spirit that we know today. And so that is the story of America's westward expansion, really the story of our nation, because it was over three centuries, if you start from the very beginning, that we expanded out to the west, and we connected the two oceans together by land, by railroad, and by a nation growing together and learning a lot about itself. Obviously, this was not a overly specific story. I didn't want to make a six-hour episode for you. I didn't think that my voice was pleasant enough to listen to for that long, but that is the story of America's westward expansion. It's the story that gives life to the term cowboys and Indians. 